Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Millionaire Real Estate Agent Podcast. I'm Jason Abrams, and this is the place where we lift the curtain on the world of real estate like never before. Every week, I sit down with visionaries, pirates, and mavericks. We're here to document, demonstrate, and most importantly, demystify their game-changing models and systems. What secrets propel them to the top, and how are they living their dreams? This is about passion, it's about strategy, but above all, it's about real, tangible success. So buckle up and let's dive in. This is the Millionaire Real Estate Agent Podcast. I am grateful for every single one of you. And that's what this episode is all about. Friends, this week we are joined by none other than Mo Anderson. Mo Anderson is the former CEO of Keller Williams. She's also the founder of KW Cares, the charity that carries the Keller Williams namesake. She is an inductee into the Oklahoma Hall of Fame. That, that's not like a little thing. That's like a whole state and the Hall of Fame. Friends, she is an absolute cultural icon. And as far as I'm concerned, she is the voice in my head that tells me to do all the good things in my life and the voice in my head that says, darling, you might not want to do that right before I'm about to do something stupid. This is the Thanksgiving episode. And the only person that I would have brought to you to talk about gratitude is the woman who taught me the definition of it. Friends, Mo Anderson. Everybody, I am joined today with none other than Mo Anderson. Mo, how are you? I'm so good. It's such an honor to have you on this podcast. And I've been excited about everybody that we've spoken with, but I am most excited about this conversation because I literally grew up sitting in the audience and watching you. And you've changed my entire trajectory of my life. And I know that's a lot before we get started, but I I need you to know that because you're celebrating a 40-year anniversary for Keller Williams this year. And in order to celebrate it the right way, I want to go all the way back in time. And I want to really talk about your story And how you ended up in real estate, and then how you ended up as Keller Williams, and then how you did what you did. So can you take me back? Take me back, uh, maybe even to before real estate. How did this happen? Well, I, I grew up on a farm. My father was a tenant farmer. And my parents really pushed me. And as a result of that, I developed a work ethic I would just put up against anybody. (laughs) This farm girl knew how to work. So I worked in the fields because my brothers were already gone. And I really, really learned to work. So work has never frightened me or I haven't ever been afraid of no matter what it is, I can do what it takes to get it done. It might take me a little while, but (laughs) I can do it. And so I graduated from the University of Oklahoma, and I worked my way through school, ended up with some debt, of course. And then I taught music in the public schools for 14 years and loved every moment of it because the two schools that I taught in were music teachers' paradises. (laughs) And going into real estate never occurred to me at all. I took the test after Richard encouraged me to go through a class with him. Well, in fact, he came home from work one day and said, I've enrolled you in a class. And I said, what kind of a class? And he said, real estate. And I said, why in the world did you do that? (laughs) And so he lies through his teeth and he says, I did it because I wanted you to be with me when I took this class. 
And actually, that wasn't true because he saw how hard I worked as a music teacher. You know, I'd cheer for my boys on the football fields on weekends, and they'd sing like birds for me during the week. (laughs) And he really wanted me to get out of teaching and go into a profession where I could make some money because we both had some school debt. And I discovered in the first couple of years of teaching that I could never fulfill a dream I had as a child, because as a child, I was tired of being poor. And I made a commitment to myself that when I grew up, I was going to make more money than I needed so I could give people gifts. I was like eight, you know, when that aha (laughs) hit my mind. And so that's why he invited me to go to that class was he was ultimately hoping I would choose real estate. He thought if I could get this woman into something that made money and with her work ethic, she would do really well. But the bottom line is he saw things in me I didn't see. He may go down in history as the greatest recruiter in the history of the real estate business. It's unbelievable. I didn't know that part of that story. He encouraged me to try real estate. And you know, there's no such thing as trying it. You either make a commitment or you don't. So he was Uh, accepted a position at the OU Health Science Center because his company, Conoco uh, Oil Company, wanted to transfer him to Houston. Our parents were ill, and we didn't really want to leave the state. So he accepted the job here in the Oklahoma City area where the Health Science Center is located. So I moved here and I tried real estate and for the first six months, nothing happened. I had a couple who uh, looked at a property I showed and I could see they loved it. And then all of a sudden they were moving in, choosing bedrooms for the children and talking about the, the little creek that ran in the backyard. They even sat down at the kitchen table and, and began to dream what life would be like. And I was so excited I could hardly stand it because I thought, I prayed and told the Lord, I just was a little bossy with him, and I said, give me three deals or I'm out of here. That's how close I came to quitting. And I had one listing, and it had just sold on August the 29th. And uh, this was August the 30th. And my challenge to God was, you give me these deals before the end of the month, deals that were really close, or I'm quitting the business. And I meant it, Jason. (laughs) Yes, ma'am. Here I had a listing that had closed, and now I, I was about to sell. On the 30th of August, I sold a new home buyer A little home, had the deal complete, had them pre-qualified by three o'clock that afternoon. I just worked with them a few hours and we found the right house. So I had two deals under contract. And I said to the Lord that night, I said, this is not fair. You do two. I ask for three. Two is close to three. And this is a little bit confusing. But the point is, I ask for three. So the next morning, I woke up mad at God. <laughs> Talked to him quite a bit. And the phone rang. It was a Saturday morning. And the phone rang. And um, this is when I showed the house that the people responded to. So I thought we were going to go to the office, write the offer. 
Suddenly, Mr. and Mrs. Byer went to the far corner in the front yard and they began to talk and my stomach began to churn because I knew for some reason it wasn't good. He walked back to me and he said, Mo, we cannot buy the house through you. We've been working with Lily Mae Tillman for weeks. She's bought us breakfast. She's purchased lunches for us. She has worked so hard for us. She's bought dinner. The kids have spilled ice cream in her car. <laughs> and he said, we just have to buy this house through her. Now, back in those days, there were rules, and I knew I was protected by the rules, but I was never going to force anybody to work with me when they had that much desire to work with a competitor. I knew who she was, but I didn't know her well, so I started to cry when they drove away because I had come so close. So I drove home knowing I was going to resign. When that evening at seven o'clock, they called me. The dad, Chuck Jones, called me and he said, Mo, Lily Mae Tillman told us to do the right thing and buy the house from you. Wow. And that completed my third deal. And after that, I did 35 transactions in the next six months because I changed my mindset. Change your mindset, change your life. I mean, that, I mean that's, I mean, look, she said it more eloquently than I did, but that's what she just said. You see, all action begins with thinking. We think, then we act. And the act of thinking is something that very few of us spend any time thinking about. Now, I just use the word act and thinking a lot. Let me go back and explain. Here's what I mean. When you're about to do something, what happens first? The thing you're about to do or thinking about the thing you're about to do? You ever wake up in the morning and all you're doing is craving pancakes? especially chocolate chip pancakes, because that's, of course, the only acceptable kind of pancake. So you decide you're going to go make chocolate chip pancakes. Let me just tell you, the thinking about the chocolate chip pancakes happened before the making it, which happened before the eating it. That proves my point. You may not have been cognizant. You didn't plant the thought there, but the thinking comes before the pancakes. That's everything in life. Bold, uh, we have this course um, that, that at Keller Williams they have, and it's called Bold. And one of the things is what you focus on expands. The things you think about get manifested in real life. And if you think hard enough about something and you get a picture of that thing in your mind, then the laws of quantum physics dictate that you can actually manifest it in this reality. And I call it this reality because you are the architect of this reality. I'll prove that to you, too. Everybody listening, look to your right, right now, really fast. I just want you to know you're the first person and the last person in the history of the entire human experience to see that moment in time, what you just saw. Now, you can't tell me what's going to come next because the future isn't written. It's manifested by first the thoughts we take, then the actions in support of those thoughts. What you heard Mo Anderson just say because she'll tell you, I, I prayed for the answer, and then it showed up. Here's what I heard. I thought about something so hard that I called it prayer. I then woke up every single day taking the actions to manifest it into happening. And the thing that gave me the strength to do it was knowing that the hand of God was on my shoulder. And all of it worked. You see, you have a beautiful mind. I'm imploring you, use it just like Mo did. How long do you stay a real estate agent before you get into the brokerage business? Less than a year. <laughs> so you, you take the jump. Well, no, How it was does that a, happen? It was the full year. And I enjoyed sales, loved meeting the people, but I just had an urge to start a company because I knew if I could motivate kids from the other side of the tracks, 
and influence them. I could do that with adults. Well, I know I could do that with adults anyway. I'd already had enough life experiences to know that. I didn't have a broker's license, so I found the two top agents in town, (laughs) and I convinced them to come for us three to join together, and they would list and sell, and I would run the office. And so we built a company of about, oh, I'd say 40 agents maybe. And then about six months after we got our company really going, we bought a Century 21 franchise. And then from 1980 to 1985, we were the number three office in production of Century 21 for five years. Wow. And, and that was at a time, it's, it's still a great company, but that was at a time when Century 21 was really in its heyday. And I mean, they were selling a lot of real estate. We were number three out of 7,500 offices in the U.S. and Canada. And we didn't have all that many agents, but the agents we had had a good productivity number per agent because that's what I'm after is an agent who really wants to develop a career in real estate and is passionate about it and has a strong desire. What was interesting is all our competitors were male businesses where the leadership were men and they laughed at us and they thought we would fail. And we just loved knowing they, that we were in their brains and occupied so much space. <laughs> it's so good. It's so good. You become known globally for this idea of culture and how important culture is. And you've had all these prestigious universities write about the culture that you built here at Keller Williams. Was culture a key component during those days also? That's where I learned how you do it. Because I don't know that I called it culture, but I called it, you know, the environment in our within our company. I knew that man is not just physical, men and women. They're physical, they're mental, and they're also spiritual. And when you build a culture, if you want it to be a values-based culture, you have to add not only the mental and the physical, you know, where you encourage your agents to eat right and all that stuff, but you add the spiritual component. And we had uh, a diversity in our company Of course, nothing like we have at Keller Williams, but that's where I kind of learned to navigate, to bring these people together and not let the spiritual be something that splits them, but to honor them and their faith and show hospitality to their particular faith. Because we were a secular company. We were just a little business doing really good. <laughs> <laughs> so so I'm gonna I'm gonna fast forward a bit. So you, you end up you, you end up meeting Gary Keller. And this part of the story is a little more well documented. He's a young kid at the time, and you meet him and, and you all decide to go into business with each other. On a handshake. On a handshake. We could spend three hours talking about how that happened. But I wanna I wanna ask you this. Early on, as you guys embarked together, you agreed upon a certain culture and a certain way of treating people. And I think most companies today, number one, I don't know that they would all be brave enough to do it the way that you did. But number two, a young entrepreneur might discount the importance of that idea. Well, you see, Gary had it, had the Y4C2Ts, an acronym that defines, predetermines how we're going to treat each other, our clients, our families, and our friends. And he did it in the very early days before he ever met me. And he had it spelled out. 
the W standing for win, win, or no deal, integrity, do the right thing, et cetera. And he did it with his ALC. It really wasn't called an ALC then. <laughs> he did it with his remaining eight top agents that Remax didn't steal. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think the question he asked them, he said, what is it you like about being business with me and what makes you proud to be part of my company? And another question was, and what is it that makes us do so well together to get along and have each other's backs and treat each other the way that we do? And he had a marker board or a chalkboard or whatever it was and they listed all the words and they had, you know, like a hundred words up there. The next day or the next week, whatever it was, he took them through a process of eliminating them. And they ended up with the words that are in our acronym. That's such an amazing story, especially now. You and I have the foresight and the benefit of now looking back and knowing that that acronym is alive and well in 58 different countries and over 200,000 agents subscribe to those ideals. Well, what's interesting about it is it was, well, two things that made me want to come with Gary when he gave me the invitation. And it was because I had never seen a real estate company put in writing their values or their beliefs. Now, we call them beliefs about how we're going to treat each other. We could also call them values because if you look at win-win integrity, customers come first, commitment in all things, communication, creativity, teamwork, equity, and success, when you look at those words they are based on a value. Every company has a culture. They may not know it, but they have a culture. <laughs> Some are cultures I wouldn't want to be a part of. <laughs> As you come in and you see the Y4C2Ts, the company then gets really bold and it, and it publishes this idea of God, family, and business in this very prescribed order. How did that happen? I put it in one of the training manuals. I put it in the FSO manual. And I took it to Dave because he, I had hired him by then. And I said, Dave, what do you think Gary will think of this? And he said, well, I don't know. Let's ask him. And he, he Dave asked him and he was fine with it. And it has stuck. <laughs> Why do you think it's stuck? Because it's inclusive of everyone. God is a symbol of whatever your faith is. And we're so big. We have every religion or branch of religion in the world. You know, there's this old saying that if you don't know what you stand for, you'll fall for anything. And I, I think that's 100% right. And so Mo Anderson knew what she stood for, God, family, and business in a very specific and prescribed order. Now, that might not be your order. Heck, that might not even be your things. But I believe that the genius of being able to say exactly what it is that you stand for in three simple words is what goes down in history as one of the most brilliant business wars stories of all times. Because you all know how it ended. They built the largest real estate company the world's ever known under one brand. This idea of making as clear as you can describe your mission, you're starting to see in companies all over the world. Look at Disney. Disney used to have this long paragraph that explained their mission statement. Then someone got a job, and the first thing they did was change it. Here's what it is today. You ready? Keep the mouse happy. That's it. Keep the mouse happy. They use that by which to know if they are doing the right thing at any given time. And everybody knows exactly what that means. Heck, you even know what that means. You know if Mickey would like something or not. Then their tech department, which used to have like two paragraphs of mission statement, they changed theirs to 
get to the fun fast. Friends, that now dictates the way that they think about technology. There's another story. There's this great story about the the UK rowing team, and they were terrible at rowing. They couldn't. They, were, they took last place. They were awful. And then the UK rowing team gets a new coach, and the first thing that coach does is he puts in one simple question before everything that they do. You ready? Will this make the boat go faster? And so now, before every decision they make, they simply say, will this make the boat go faster? Should we go eat fish and chips for the next 11 hours? Will this make the boat go faster? Probably not. Should we do a two-a-day today? Will this make the boat go faster? So this simple question, just like with the simple Mickey Mouse, just like with God, family, business, it gives everybody, number one, an exact idea of who we are and what we stand for. And number two, a compass by which to know if the decisions we're about to make are the right ones. I think that's, she's got so many, but I think that's the true genius, which is oversimplifying one of the most complex ideas on the planet, which is how do I wake up every day and treat people in such a way that everybody's life gets better? God, family, business. You were inducted into the Oklahoma State Hall of Fame. Oh, yes. And what that was such an honor. And I was lucky enough to have traveled to Oklahoma to, to see your portrait hanging there. But part of that is you've gotten to meet many other people that have been inducted as well. Is there one or two things that you've learned through that experience that you could pass on to us? Well, the first thing I learned was that the impossible can be possible. <laughs> because the Hall of Fame was totally outside of my realm of thinking. I had attended many of them, but I never dreamed that a kid from a dirt farm would ever be considered. Because when you listen to most of the stories, you know, they just had different lives than I had. Sure. And when they called to tell me, I said, I think you've made a mistake. I don't <laughs> know of anybody that nominated me. Well, Kelly had kept all that from me. And um, that, that, you know what? If that's the only lesson you learn, that the impossible well, I've, can I've be. I've learned a lot of lessons from knowing people. I think Jane Giroux, who was, Miss America in 1967. <laughs> She's a real good friend of mine, and I always dreamed of meeting her. And when we moved to Oklahoma City, she lived here and was an anchor on one of the TV stations. And we met in the state house in the where the governor offices. And we didn't really know each other, but we at least met. And then many years later, we met again and had a chance to really visit and talk. And we became really best friends. And she had so many amazing things happen to her. And she was the daughter of a basketball coach in Laverne, Oklahoma, which was as small as Wacomas, Oklahoma. <laughs> and her humble spirit is so remarkable because she's never let Miss America or, or anything like that go to her head. You know, she went to visit the troops with Bob Hope. Wow. And had experiences back then when Miss America was such a big thing. And then everybody in the world wanted her to work for them when she finished her term as Miss America. And she just displays the characteristics of everything in our y 4 c 2 ts And you've probably heard me say 10 million times, yes, we're working to be the number one company, but we won't be it very long if we get arrogant and sassy about it. And we can't let that arrogance enter our executive team or in, our, in the people in the field. Because I've watched that. I'm 86 and I've seen a lot. Yes, ma'am. 
And when Remax was number one, what happened to them shortly after they were number one? Hmm. Ching. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, this is so eye-opening for me. I, well, let me ask you this. You said it, not me, because I'm not a lot. You're never supposed to ask someone how old they are, but you're 86. I'm 43. And I know a bunch of the people listening to this are less than 86. So if you were going to- Everybody is. <laughs> there might be a few that I'm are the less- oldest person in the company. <laughs> yes, yes. But you know what's really fun? I don't know. At, at Mega Camp, we just had, we had Richard Stone on stage and he's 76 and he's still working 135 days a year, knocking on doors from 10 o'clock to one o'clock and he made over a million dollars. And when I was interviewing him, he was at Lake Cuomo in Italy. And I said to him, Richard, I want to talk about next year's plan. And he said, I'll do you one better. Let me tell you my 10-year plan. And then he just started talking, Mo. And I said to him at the end, I said, I just want to remind you, you're 76 years old right now. You're telling me you're, you have a plan until you're 86. And he said, no, no, no. I have a plan until I'm 106, but I didn't want to overwhelm you. And that you could have knocked my socks off with that. Let me ask you this, what advice, and this whole interview has been advice, but when you talk to younger people and you're talking to a 43-year-old who's trying to raise a 10-year-old, when you talk to them, what's the life advice that you give? Not the business advice, but the life advice. I tell them that it is critical for them to have faith, whichever faith they choose, because when you hit the hard bumps in life, when you're faced with a major challenge, you have a son or a daughter that's an alcoholic or on drugs, or you've had a child killed in a car wreck. Whenever you hit those places, you have to lean into your faith. You won't survive without it. Look at the suicide rate in various communities in our, I don't mean geographical communities, I mean people communities. Sure. And we see in almost every community, the suicide rate goes up. And that means we have people who have no hope. And faith gives you hope. And that. when you lean into that, you will make it through whatever it is you're having to deal with. I love that. I mean, it's very sage advice from a very wise person. And when you ha have no faith and you have no holy book that gives you guidance about that, because I've tried to get a little bit acquainted with many of the different holy books and I know for sure that do unto others as you would have them do unto you as in every one of them. It may be worded a little bit differently, but it's there. Universal truth. So that is the first thing. You want You want to know more? <laughs> Mo, I could talk to you forever and learn more, but I, I think that I don't think it's going to get any better than that. Okay. That's for sure. Let me ask you this. I'm going to close this up. We're going to go into the lightning round. And, and this is just for fun, but I'm curious. I want to ask you a few questions. Okay. What is your favorite food? Ice cream and hot bread, homemade hot bread with butter. You, we'd be perfect for each other, my dear. That is, you and I are absolutely there. What's your favorite color? The color I have on today, purple. It's a king's color, and I'm a child of the king. I love that. What, what's your favorite sound? What sound do you love? I love the sound of a violin enveloped with the orchestra. So, so that might be the greatest answer to that question that, that we've had. I'm, I'm going to ask, although I'm pretty confident I know the answer. What's your favorite book, and what's the one that you would want everyone listening to this to read? The Dream Giver. I knew it. Wilkinson, Wilkinson is the author. And, you know, I, I'm 86 and I'm dreaming about my 90s and on into the my hundreds, however far I go. And I'm as excited about some of my dreams as I was when I was 43. <laughs> That's so great to hear. And when people that. stop dreaming, 
and stop working toward a dream or a or a desire, then I've watched so many of my friends get sick. Many, many of my friends are gone and they lose, they lose a vision. They lose their vision. They lose their dream. So I tell people retirement will kill you. (laughs) No no wonder we see you. (laughs) We see you so often here. Yes, that 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 that's about right. All right, last question. Favorite movie? Gone with the Wind. And well, I have two favorites: Gone with the Wind and Charlton Heston in the Ten Commandments. There it is, friends. You just heard it, Mo Anderson. Thank you so much for leading us today. I just can't believe you asked me, and this has been so much fun. Yes, we Maybe have. we can do it again. <laughs> I think I think we will. Well, how's that for a happy Thanksgiving episode? Unbelievable. Uh, you know, I've known Mo Anderson now since I was 23 years old. I, at that time, was the youngest team leader, at, which think of it as an office manager if you're not with Keller Williams, in the United States. And I'll never forget, I came to Austin, Texas for a class. And I'll never forget the first thing that Mo said to me. She said, Jason, sit down, because I had been pacing in the back of the room. And I'll never forget that for as long as I live. But you know what? She cared enough to tell me to sit down. And throughout my entire career, she has sent me little notes when I've done things well in my local market. When I actually got a job working at Keller Williams International, she called to tell me that the hand of God was on my shoulder and that I should have no fear. I talk to her on a regular basis, and to let you in, a little inside baseball on what it's done for my life, there hasn't been a time when the words in her head have not served me well, because 100% of the advice she's given me has been about taking the high road, always. We're all about to sit back and eat tons of turkey and be with family if you're lucky enough to do that, and I want you to know. For those of you that have family members that might be in service somewhere else, thank you for your service. For those of us that have family members that aren't able to be with us because they are gone, honor those memories. And for those of us that are sitting down with families, this might be the year to tell everybody just one more time how much you love them and how much they mean to you. Mo cast a vision for a company that turned global. That vision was God, family, and business. This Thanksgiving, I would implore you in between football games and stuffing to ask yourself the question, what's my unique voice to the world? What's my mission? Have I articulated in such a way that other people understand it? Because here's the number one lesson that I learned from O. Anderson. Never be ashamed of who you are and what you believe. And if you say it loud enough and often enough, you'll find an entire world of people who agree with you and ultimately would like to join you on your life's journey. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. We love you. We'll see you on the next show. And there it is. That wraps another episode. Friends, I don't know what you're taking out of this. I really don't. I'll tell you what I want you to be taking out of it, which is these are the people that are having tremendously big lives. And the reason it's happening is because they're setting up the models and systems to do just that. Gary Keller told me that leadership is teaching people how to think so that they do the things they need to do when they need to do them so that ultimately they get the things they want when they want to have them. And that's what I want for you. You're all leaders, but it begins with leading ourselves. If you're enjoying this podcast, I want you to click the subscribe button anywhere that you get your podcasts. We want to be the voice in your head every single week, and every week we're dropping new content. We also send out a newsletter at the conclusion of every show to make sure that you get the highest points and the models and systems that were discussed. So if you want to sign up, I need your name and your email address. Head over to the millionaireagentpodcast.com. Millionaireagentpodcast.com. Enter your name and your email address, and every week 
that newsletter will be in your box. Friends, you just went on a journey. I hope that what happens between now and the next time we meet is absolutely wonderful for you. Thanks for listening. I'll see you next week. This podcast is for general informational purposes only. The views, thoughts, and opinions of the guest represent those of the guest and not KWRI and its affiliates and should not be construed as financial, economic, legal, tax, or other advice. This podcast is provided without any warranty or guarantee of its accuracy, completeness, timeliness, or results from using the information. 